a very popular Flat Earth video called Flat Earth in 5 Minutes by ODD TV makes several spurious and unscientific assertions and arguments that are quite easy to debunk if you know just a little bit of science. So, let's jump right in. Water, when unmanipulated, is to find its level. So whether you look at a cup of water, a bathtub, a swimming pool, a lake, or the ocean, it's flat. Of course, natural motion is not considered and doesn't equal a curve. Water finds its level is a very vague and unscientific way to express the physics of liquids. The undeniable fact is that water and all liquids conform to the forces acting on them. Put water in a container of any shape, and it will conform to the shape of the container. Shoot water up at an angle, and it will arc back down in a predictable parabola shape. Put water on a giant sphere with trillions of tons of mass, which results in gravity pulling towards the center, and the water will easily and naturally conform to the shape of the sphere. And what force do they think causes water to find its level anyway? Of course, it's gravity. But for some childishly naive reason, they think the direction of gravity's pull must be a universal downward direction, rather than the proven fact that the pull of gravity is relative to the center of mass of the objects involved. On the Earth, and on all other celestial bodies, gravity pulls toward the center, which you can even see for yourself by watching the moons of Jupiter orbit the planet through a telescope. Water curves around the Earth due to Earth's gravity, but the amount of curve is just too slight to easily see directly from our vantage point, so it looks flat. We have zero authentic pictures of the Earth and they're all composites, and NASA even admits that they Photoshop Earth images. It is Photoshop, but it's, it's, has to be. This claim is both untrue and intentionally deceptive. We do have thousands of photographs of the Earth from space that are not composites, such as those taken from the Apollo missions seen here. These are true photographs of the spherical Earth viewed from a wide variety of distances. NASA also does produce composited and enhanced images. They do this to be able to show more detail in a single picture. If you take a bunch of close-ups and stitch them together, you can show more detail than you can with a single image taken at a greater distance. But this does not mean that these images are created from scratch computer-generated fakes, as the video implies. They are composited photographs, not fake computer graphics. What part of the word photograph do you not understand? The quote from Rob Simon of NASA is taken out of context and refers to high-resolution images of the Earth taken from low-Earth orbit satellites and composited together to produce detailed images of the whole Earth. Furthermore, today we have numerous satellites taking photographs of the Earth all the time, including NASA's Discover satellite and Japan's Himawari 8 weather satellite. Again, these are enhanced photographs, not fake CGI. On numerous occasions, NASA admits that we can't go beyond low Earth orbit, which is between 99 miles and 1,200 miles away. The interesting thing is that the moon is said to be 238,000 miles away, which is a difference of 236,800 miles. Really? Are we actually supposed to believe that NASA whose most famous achievement is putting men on the moon, actually admitted we've never been above low Earth orbit? No, of course not. In another video, ODD TV shows us some short clips to support this claim, such as these. And it will be able to launch the Orion capsule with humans on board, as well as uh, landers or other uh, components to, be, to destinations beyond Earth orbit. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest that we can go. And As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. But Orion has protection. Shielding will be put to the test as the vehicle cuts through the waves of radiation. 
These clips are cherry-picked and obviously taken out of context. When they say we can't go beyond Earth orbit, they simply mean that, at the time, we had no currently active spacecraft programs designed to do that. The Space Shuttle and the International Space Station have been the primary space programs of the last few decades since Apollo, and were designed to put men and payloads into orbit, not into deep space. But the new Orion program currently in development is designed to take astronauts to the moon, asteroids, Mars, and possibly beyond. Official NASA videos about Orion make it very clear that we have sent humans beyond Earth orbit before, just not since Apollo. America has a new spacecraft. Its name is Orion. It will take us beyond Earth orbit for the first time in a generation. The unpiloted first flight of the SLS will pave the way for future missions with astronauts traveling beyond low Earth orbit for the first time since the Apollo era. And the dishonesty gets even worse. This is another of the clips he used. Called the Orion Multipurpose Crew Vehicle, or MPCV, this next generation spacecraft will enable America to explore beyond low Earth orbit. But he intentionally left out the very next sentence. This next generation spacecraft will enable America to explore beyond low Earth orbit for the first time in more than 40 years. Wow, what does it say about your claims if you have to lie like this? No matter if you're on the ground, on top of a building, a mountain, a hot air balloon, an airplane, or looking at high altitude amateur balloon footage, the horizon never fails to rise right to your eyes. This is a very common flat earth claim, but it is just an assertion. I have yet to see a single flat earther test it scientifically. How did you determine that the horizon rises to eye level? In fact, the horizon does not rise to eye level, but it is hard to tell. As you rise to a higher elevation, the horizon gets farther and farther away. So our viewing angle down to the horizon gets only slightly larger and stays very low. With simple geometry, you can calculate this angle, called the horizon dip angle. At 100 feet high, it is only 0 0.17 degrees. At 1,000 feet, it's still only 0.56 degrees. At 10,000 feet, 1.7 degrees. And even at airliner altitudes of 40,000 feet, the angle is a mere 3.5 degrees. The angle is just way too small for you to accurately detect it without a precise measuring device, especially at the low elevations we normally experience. It is going to look close to eye level, but it is slightly below eye level at all times. The angle is so small that this illustration greatly exaggerates it. It is impossible to show the true scale. How do you know you aren't tipping your head or your camera just slightly when looking out to the horizon? I don't have a magical leveling device in my head. No one does. The slightest tilt up or down of a few degrees would be imperceptible to us without a leveling instrument. I'm still waiting for a flat earther to use an accurate leveling device, such as a theatolite or transit level, to prove their claim that the horizon stays at eye level. They can't, because it doesn't. Whether you are looking at Toronto's skyline from Niagara on the Lake, 31 miles away, Chicago's skyline from Union Pier, 43 miles away, or even Oahu from Kauai, which is up to 108 miles away from center to center, or 73 miles away from the closest points, you will not see any curvature where it's supposed to be. According to the Pythagorean Theorem, which states that the curvature of the Earth is 8 inches per mile squared, Oahu should not be visible whatsoever, but you can see the whole thing. First of all, it is important to know that flat earthers are all using the same incorrect calculation when talking about the curve of the Earth. The 8 inches per mile squared calculation 
does not measure the curvature of the line of sight or tell you how much of an object should be hidden by the horizon. Rather, it measures the drop from an imaginary horizontal line extended out from the viewer's position. That is measurement D in this diagram. You can easily see that this does not tell us how much will be hidden behind the horizon. There is a different calculation for that. There is a website that will do that calculation correctly for you for any distance and viewing height at metabunk.org curve. The details of the calculation are explained on that site as well. When you use the correct calculation, all his examples are perfectly explained on the spherical Earth. From a viewing height of just 10 feet, which is generously low, viewing Toronto 31 miles away only results in 490 feet hidden by the curve of the Earth. But many of the buildings are much taller than that. The CN Tower is over 1,800 feet. The same goes for Chicago at 43 miles. About 1,020 feet will be hidden at that distance, but the Willis Tower is 1,450 feet tall. And as you can see in his own image, you can only see the tops of the tallest buildings, not all the way to the ground. And even Oahu from Kauai is no problem. Notice how he failed to mention the heights involved. The highest peak in Kauai is 5,243 feet and the distance to that peak from the western shore of Oahu is about 90 miles. From a height of just 10 feet, you can see the top of Kauai, as only 4,945 feet will be hidden by the curve, leaving about 300 feet visible. But his image seems to be taken from significantly higher than 10 feet above sea level, which will show even more of the island. In 1887, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley conducted what's known as the Michelson-Morley experiment. This experiment was attempting to prove the speculated motion of the Earth around the Sun. And when it failed, Albert Einstein was forced to form the theory of relativity to overcome this problem. In fact, anytime mainstream science is faced with undesirable results, they create a workaround which isn't real science at all. The Michelson-Morley experiment was designed to show the motion of the Earth through the hypothetical ether, the medium through which people once thought that light traveled. Rather than failing to show Earth's movement, it actually failed to show the existence of the ether. In fact, more recent optical resonator experiments confirmed the absence of any ether wind at sensitivity levels far exceeding what Michelson and Morley were capable of detecting. All physicists today agree that the hypothesized ether does not exist. Einstein's theory of relativity, on the other hand, has been confirmed by many different observations and experiments. The strength of the theory lies in its unique ability to correctly predict to high precision the outcome of an extremely diverse range of experiments. On what basis, I wonder, does ODD assert that the Michelson and Morley experiment proved the Earth does not move, but rejects Einstein's work, when the entire scientific community and all the experiments and data gathered over the last 100 years point to the opposite. Surely not a scientific basis. It appears to be purely based on confirmation bias, a belief rather than a reasoned conclusion that the Earth is flat. The sun is claimed to be 93 million miles away, with a radius of over 400,000 miles, but can easily be proven to be much closer and smaller by tracing the crepuscular rays back to its origin in the sky. If the sun were indeed 93 million miles away, it would simply be impossible to have angled sun rays, as they should all consistently come in straight. Crepuscular rays do not prove the sun is close. They are simply due to perspective. The sun is so far away that its rays are essentially parallel when they reach the Earth. Notice that the pictures you see of these types of rays typically show that the sun is low in the sky and directly behind the rays. The rays peek through gaps in the clouds and reflect off vapor or dust particles in the atmosphere. But since they are angled toward the viewer, they appear to diverge, just as any other parallel lines will appear when viewed at an angle, 
such as train tracks, telephone lines, or football field markings. And when viewed from directly above, you can see that the rays are parallel. It's funny how flat earthers will misuse the effect of perspective when it is to their benefit, and in this case, ignore it altogether. According to the globular theory, a lunar eclipse occurs when the sun, earth, and moon are in a direct line. But it is on record that since about the 15th century, over 50 eclipses have occurred while both the sun and moon are visible above the horizon. F.H. Cook, The Terrestrial Plane When a lunar eclipse occurs, the round shadow of the spherical Earth crosses the face of the moon. On some occasions, both the sun and the moon can be seen at the same time in the sky during the eclipse. But this is due to atmospheric refraction. At low angles, the atmosphere can act like a lens, which bends the light of the sun and moon a little bit around the curve of the earth. But this effect only lasts one to six minutes, and only if you are viewing from the right place, before the sun or moon sets behind the horizon. Flat earthers have no scientific answer for what causes lunar eclipses in the first place, so using them as evidence for a flat earth is odd indeed. Especially considering the simple fact that lunar eclipses always occur at full moon, when the moon is opposite the sun, which very clearly indicates that the round shadow we see on the moon is none other than that of the spherical earth. It's a common misconception that the shadow of the earth causes moon phases. Even the pastors and priests of the science religion readily admit this fact. The interesting thing about moon phases is that they are always the exact same eight phases repeated. But if we were circling around the sun, these eight phases would inevitably be reversed from the summer to winter seasons. No, wrong again. Flat earthers seem to struggle with frames of reference among many other things. From our frame of reference, the moon constantly circles us. The relative position of the sun does shift as we orbit around the sun, but that is just part of the cycle. At no point do the moon's phases need to flip. What would that even look like? Look at this animation. Do you see any flipping of the dark and light sides of the moon? No. It just takes a little longer to go through each cycle because of the Earth's orbit. By the time the moon has come back around toward the sun, the Earth's position has shifted. But there is no reason we would notice that. It just makes the moon cycle a little bit longer than it would be if we were not orbiting the sun, about two days longer. His diagram shows the phases from outside the solar system. But of course, that is not how we view it, so it is misleading. From our frame of reference on the Earth, the moon's phases just occur in a continuous cycle, gradually changing each day, and the Earth's orbit around the Sun is just a natural and consistent part of the cycle. We are told that the Earth spins at 1,040 miles per hour, while the Earth travels around the Sun at 66,000 miles per hour. Meanwhile, the whole solar system is going inside the Milky Way galaxy at a speed of 490,000 miles per hour. And finally, the entire Milky Way galaxy is darting through infinite space at over 1 million miles per hour. Most people believe this, and yet every experiment ever conducted to prove even the simple spin of the Earth has failed. Um, no. Look at the stars each night, and notice, in the northern hemisphere, they appear to rotate counterclockwise around the northern celestial pole, and a star called Polaris. And in the southern hemisphere, Different stars appear to rotate around the southern celestial pole in the opposite direction, clockwise. This alone proves the Earth spins. You can see thousands of time-lapsed imagery of this, produced independently by professional and amateur astronomers. As for the Earth's orbit around the Sun, we don't see that because the stars are so tremendously far away. Our trip around the sun is minuscule in comparison, so our view only changes by a tiny, barely measurable amount, not large enough for us to see. And as for all the other movements, we don't see them because all the stars we see with the naked eye 
are in the Milky Way galaxy with us, moving at about the same speed and direction with us. The same thing goes for curvature. It's never been proven, and the only time we see it is in movies, NASA CGI, or when we're looking through a distorted fisheye lens. So, we have never seen the curvature? Well, only if you reject all images of Earth from space, and only if you have never seen the sun or moon rise or set, they obviously slide behind the horizon due to the Earth's curvature, rather than shrinking out of view as they would if they were just circling above a flat Earth. And only if you have never measured the angle of the sun or stars above the horizon with a sextant to determine your latitude, as sailors have done for centuries. And only if you have never watched the stars rotate around two celestial poles. We can easily detect the curvature in these ways, and many other ways. But if you just look out at the surface, it looks flat, because it is so big and we are so close to it. We can only see a tiny part of the Earth, unless we are in space, and it only curves by a tiny 1% every 69 miles. And we don't just detect the curve, we also measure it directly. For centuries, Geodesic surveying techniques have been used to accurately measure the Earth's curvature for the purposes of allocating land, laying out cities, and making maps. When measuring large segments of land, the Earth's curvature becomes readily apparent. The angles of a triangle on a plane always add up to 180 degrees. But if you accurately measure any sufficiently large triangle on the surface of the Earth, you will unfailingly discover that the sum of the angles exceeds 180 degrees by a little bit. This is called spherical excess, and it is due to the Earth's curvature. Flat Earthers love to claim we can't see the curve, but fail to accept all the ways we can scientifically detect it and measure it. Thanks for watching. Be sure to watch my video series, Proving the Earth is Not Flat, and also Click here to subscribe.